Hello and welcome to Aging Matters, a program featuring individuals who talk about aging issues of interest to older adults and their families. I'm Cheryl Beversdorf, your host. Today, I'm pleased to share another episode of Aging Matters Stories of Life, programs featuring guests whose life experiences made a difference to them and to their community. My guest is Stephen Eisenbrown, longtime diplomat in the U.S. Foreign Service, also editor-in-chief for a State Department publication, and now an author. Stephen will talk about his work as a Foreign Service political officer and the historic events occurring <coughs> in countries where he was assigned. He will also talk about being at the Department of State as the editor-in-chief of the department's annual human rights reports. And finally, he will tell us about his evolving career as an author. So welcome, Stephen, and thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Cheryl. Well, let's get started by talking about a little of your background. Where were you born and raised? Describe your early years. I was born in central Iowa in July of 1947. And my mother said it was the most historic at that time heat wave that had ever occurred in Iowa. And as a matter of fact, the beatnik writer, John Kerouac, in his novel, uh, on the road, he was passing through central Iowa, and he wrote also about that great heat wave. So I've always had an affinity, at least in my mind, with him. <laughs> and it sounds like you're very much identifying with our weather right now. Exactly. As, as well. <laughs> so, and where did you go to school and write in Iowa? Well, I or? was lucky that uh, my parents chose to live in this really nice town. Marshalltown was the name and 25,000, uh, not tiny, not large, but it was uh, almost a Hallmark type of environment. Uh, very pretty, uh, big elm trees. Um, it was a nice place to grow up, really good school system, which is one of the reasons they chose to live there. So uh, I grew up in a quite stable environment in Iowa, uh, from kindergarten through high school, in the same oh. town, and then I, you want to know where I went to college. I yes. went to college, no, yes, exactly. College. So where did you attend college? Well, as a matter of fact, yes, I branched out later in life, but at the beginning I went to, uh, uh, well, a state teacher's college, which became the University of Northern Iowa while I was there. I was there in the late 60s. And I thought I was going to be a teacher, and I was for four years before I went off and explored the world a bit and joined the Foreign Service. So my sense is that you did do graduate work then as well, or how did yes, that work? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I want, well, I had my eye, I didn't, of course, have any idea about the Foreign Service until I had this wonderful professor uh, at Cedar Falls, that's the University of Northern Iowa, the Chinese, uh, Ching Sealing was his name. He's long since passed on, but he was a great influence in my life. He had been a, a diplomat with the Republic of China's uh, Foreign Service. And then he retired from that and he began teaching. And he really influenced me both as a, he was a teacher and then we became friends for years and years afterwards. And so that's what made me begin to think about a life in, and learn about life in the Foreign Service and learn about what the American Foreign Service was. And did you do some student work in India? Yes, I realized that I needed to have some foreign experience and I had somehow managed to avoid taking any serious language courses in college and so I had to make up for that. I was lucky enough to get a fellowship to India uh, 1973-74. It was a fellowship from an institute at the University of Chicago. And uh, there were about 12-15 students that were on that program. All of them had backgrounds already in India, and I was starting out as a novice. Uh, but I, <laughs> I mean, before it was over, the India portion of my life was 10 years. And uh, so I studied Hindi, at, and, and the program was at Delhi University. Uh, I can't say that I learned a great deal of Hindi at that time, but I learned an awful lot about India. And my wife and I at that time, we lived with two different Indian families. 
And that made a big difference that we learned about the culture. And that led you to the, the, the Foreign well, Service? As a, yes, and I was well aware. I, had, uh, I, I was aware that every year there was a written exam for the Foreign Service. It traditionally was in December for decade after decade. And uh, so in December of 73, I took a taxi from the older part of the city on a Saturday morning, uh, clear across to the U.S. Embassy, which uh, hosted about 15 or 20 wannabes who took, sat down for the written exam, and I was one of those, and we sat in the cafeteria, and uh, we felt very privileged because we were already in the Foreign Service. It was in the embassy, and we were able to have uh, some coffee. and. Uh, took the exam. And one of the first questions on the written exam was a picture of an Indian sitar. And the question was, what is this instrument? And I thought, okay, <laughs> I, this is destiny. <laughs> you knew this was the right job for you. That's right. So how, what is the process then in terms of determining where you go first? I, I know you've gone to quite a few different countries or while you were there, so how did that work? In that era, I actually, well, once I got through the oral exams back in Washington uh, and the physical exam and so forth, and the Foreign Service in its mysterious way decided that they really did want to hire me as a junior officer, that was a period where they still assigned people uh, kind of arbitrarily. Well, it wasn't entirely arbitrary, but... Uh, uh, the, the individual had almost no input into where he or she was going to be sent. And they looked at me and they said, oh, you're recently back from India. And I had been going to graduate school too, um, at Johns Hopkins in uh, foreign policy matters. Uh, but I was still recently back from India. I had scored modestly well on the Hindi exams uh, in, that the Foreign Service gives all new hires. They give language exams. And I did well enough. And they said, we have just exactly the job for you. Of course, it will require uh, studying 10 months worth of intensive Bengali and then going to this new country of Bangladesh, uh, which had gotten its independence only in early 72. And so this was, they were saying this to me in about 75. And so it, the country was new, it was fragile. It was kind of a bloody start, actually, a very bloody start to the country. Well, it was pretty exciting. And so I didn't think that learning Bengali after learning the, the, the sister language of Hindi, but I went ahead and I did that, and I'm glad because uh, I really enjoyed uh, Bengali. And I had a very good teacher who insisted that my accent be good. And <clears throat> later on, when I got to Bangladesh, and I felt pretty cocky about my ability. It wasn't that great, of course, but I thought it was good. And uh, a Bengali lady uh, hostess at a dinner party said, you know, you don't sound like an American speaking Bengali. You sound like a Hindi speaker speaking Bengali. Somebody from Delhi, for example. And I was quite flattered by that. I was going to say, that's a nice compliment. Well, uh, but I went out there also because I was being offered a political officer's job. And uh, foreign service officers almost never, ever go out on their first assignments as a political officer. They almost always go as consular officers. Well, I could have been a consular officer, that's fine, but I was hired into the political cone, and, cone, that's our terminology for specialty. And I uh, thought it was tremendous to go out and be a political officer and poke around the country and meet political leaders, students, whoever might have some knowledge about what was going on. Of course, it was very hard to figure out what was going on because it was, uh, when we got, I, well, my wife and I got to Bangladesh in 1975, it was, um, um, Trans, uh, military government, and they, the government did not allow politics, so it was very hard to know. And so that gave me a lot of scope to poke around and talk to students and talk to. Uh, one of the things I most enjoyed was 
looking up old timers, pol political leaders from an earlier era, uh, 20, 30 years earlier. And if I could find them with the help of friends, in, or not friends, but employees in the uh, embassy, um, go talk to them and get their perspective on events. That I found to be very enjoyable. Well, let's. One of the things that we'd like to hear about is some of the other countries oh. that you were there, uh, because and was there any particular occurrence that happened while you were uh, in the Foreign Service in that yes. country? What was your role? Well, let's jump on to the second assignment, which was um, Pakistan. On the other side of India, I a student in India. Here I went to Bangladesh, and then after two years, I went over to Lahore, uh, which is the uh, the most sophisticated city in Pakistan, but it's not the capital, so it was a consulate. But I was a political officer there, and I was number two in the consulate, and um, I had a lot of freedom, again, to f try to figure out what was going on in the political environment under a military leader, which uh, did his best, who did his best to squash political activity. Mm -hmm. What was dramatic during that assignment was that I arrived in 78 and in 1979, the day before thanks, American Thanksgiving, there was a, a sudden explosion of anger against Americans and uh, tens of thousands of students uh, rose up in anger and uh, demonstrated against the American embassy and the consulates and a couple of the American banks. They burned the embassy to the ground and they tried to do the same thing where I was in Lahore, but the police were able to keep them from doing that. But it was still a pretty scary thing. And then all the dependents and all the so-called non-essential personnel were evacuated with about 24 hours notice, and they were gone for six months. And there was a change of personnel in the consulate in Lahore, and I found my, they left me in charge. I was, it was a small, uh, there was only four officers, but I was in charge. And that was pretty unusual for a second tour officer, especially when it was such a volatile political environment. And we assumed, we were a bit afraid that, that they, because the students had not been able to burn out the American consulate the way they had in Islamabad at the embassy, that they would come back and finish the job. Well, so we were on pins and needles a bit, but it didn't happen. So that was the most dramatic thing that occurred in uh, in, in Lahore. And you also were in Kenya? Yes, uh, but before Kenya, I went back to Washington and I was on the India desk. So here I was, uh, a student out in India, but uh, about eight years later, I found myself the, you know, one of the India desk officers. There were a number of them, but I was the political officer for India. And that was the um, early 80s. I understand that one event that occurred while you were in the Foreign Service was also uh, dancing and uh, <laughs> dining in the White House. Well, the Reagans were really generous. Uh, I don't know that any other administration did this, but uh, they, when they had a, a state dinner for a visiting president or prime minister, they invited the desk officer from the State Department to come as well. Of course, the very the Secretary of State would be there, and that usually would suffice. But the, the Reagans said, no, include the desk officer way down the hierarchy. So my wife and I did go to uh, dinner at the White House in July of 82, and that included the whole thing from uh, the, the dinner and the toasts and what have you, and then dancing afterwards. Oh, and the entertainment uh, was the New York Philharmonic for the first time in history, and I doubt it's ever been re replicated, they came down from New York because the conductor was of Indian birth, that's Zubin Mehta, and the whole orchestra was there at the White House out on the lawn, and fortunately it was a nice. beautiful evening. After the Foreign Service, uh, how long were you in the Foreign Service, when did you retire, and what happened next? Well, I was in the Foreign Service 28 years, from 1975 to 2002. Uh, and I had probably more assignments in Washington than some of my colleagues did. It was just the, the way things evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, you said, did I, I served in Kenya. Yes, I did serve in Kenya. I ran the consulate in Mombasa. And uh, uh, Kenya is a very exotic country. And then it just happens that 
uh, in that period, Kenya was, and Africa was really interesting in the culture in the United States and the film Out of Africa uh, yes. uh, you know, was made. And that, that takes place, the true story, it took place in Kenya. And then the author who had written the story on which the film was based, of course it's a true story, but she'll, she still wrote the love story part of it, uh, was living in Mombasa and we became really close friends. And she was uh, the uh, executive assistant to the director. A uh, lot of fun. Well, I want to get on to talking about your role as the editor-in-chief for the Country Reports on Human Rights. Right. Tell us what that is. Well, so I, uh, I retired from the Foreign Service in 2002, but friends of mine who had <coughs> continued on after their retirement and they were working in the office that put out these reports on human rights. It's the State Department's largest publication, actually. Um, a very influential report. But anyway, they, they suggested that I might want to work over there, too, and they put in a good word. And so I retired on a Friday, and I came back on a Monday, and I was still working at the State Department, but I was now a retiree. And they needed desperately someone who would edit the India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the, the, the South Asian reports. And uh, so I just simply moved into that. And there was no applying for the job. I was just asked if I would do that. And so I have, that was 2003, I believe, and I uh, have been working in that office ever since. And a few years later, there was a reorganization and they asked me to actually be the editor in chief. So, on these reports, is this really focused then on all countries, and yes. particularly in connection with human rights? Yes. It's legislation that the Congress okay. uh, wrote in the mid-70s. Uh, human rights was developing on the world stage, and certainly uh, in America, as a uh, consequence, I think, of the Vietnam War and atrocities that occurred there. And so human rights, and President Carter had this as a, uh, his concern as well in the White House. And so the human rights reports were created by the Congress, and the intent was to, and that's continued all these years, or decades, uh, to inform the Congress about human rights um, in a non-partisan type of way, just simply a report that would talk about the events uh, in certain categories mistreatment of uh, prisoners, for example, or disappearances, or uh, threats to journalists, and uh, so forth, uh, very systematically according to the legislation. But it's the Congress who created the reports, and then they gave the State Department, a certain office in the State Department, the responsibility to actually uh, establish a program and carry it out year by year. And then well, there has to be someone who sort of administers the program uh, uh, to work with other elements in the, uh, in, in the department on the instructions and what they should involve, and then actually hiring, you might say, influencing others to come and work in the program. And so, of course, there were a few people that I knew who were experts in one area or another, uh, geographic areas, and so I asked them to join, and after a while, well, it turned into, first it was a job, then it was a, uh, a hobby, and now it's become basically a second career, and that's uh, about 17 or so years, and I'm still doing it. And, and Stephen, <laughs> as you think about your career, both in the Foreign Service as well as the, the human rights uh, reports. Can you really comment uh, or share with us what have been the most significant global challenges oh. that you have, have observed? You know global developments or challenges in the, my period. Maybe I would say there are about three. One of course is that the explosion in the interest worldwide not just in the United States of human rights. It's on the agenda in practically every meeting at every level, not just here in Washington, but in capitals all over the world. Uh, there are plenty of abuses out there in the world to report, but the interest is ever-growing. Every year it is, there is uh, 
a greater focus on human rights. That's one thing. But then another thing, since I, I spent my entire career in former colonial areas, essentially it was in the former British Empire, now the British Commonwealth, from India to Pakistan to Bangladesh to Kenya, and then I was also in Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa, that too was a British colony at one time. Well, all of that is gone, and this transition in my career, uh, I, I, I started in the Foreign Service when uh, there had just, many countries were just being born out of colonialism, and they've all had uh, various, uh, they've all taken different roads in their political maturation. Um, but when I started in India, uh, first as a student, my goodness, the country had only been independent for about 26 years. And the in British influence was so strong. And I could talk to, well, they weren't even that old, but political leaders and others, and they wanted to tell me stories about what it was like under British rule. And so that was an, something that evolved during my career. So here you are now thinking about your third career, which is an author, and we have three books here. So in the time we have left, um, what, what's going to happen now? What, what kinds of books are you writing, and um, what are you looking for in terms of the future? In the summer of 2020, which uh, we were almost all in, basically in quarantine, uh, didn't have, I was working from home, but there, it was a slow period. And uh, I'd sit out on my uh, back porch and overlook the small garden we have and the rose bushes. And, and I, I, ha I felt a need for some reason to recount some of the stories uh, from my youth, some in the Foreign Service, but some just from other aspects of my life. And so I just kept writing these stories with no in t purpose except to, and that turned out to be the first book here. And then I just, kept writing. And after a while, I realized I was developing enough for a second book. So one's collected tales, and then the other is more collected tales. They're all first person. All the stories happened to me. But in the meantime, I began thinking I needed to do something a little more serious. And so I created a novel, which is this one. <clears throat> First, it was based on my experience in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and Kenya. But through the eyes of a fictional, fictitious uh, foreign correspondent who meets a beautiful woman, of course, and they have a romance. So it's adventure in one sense, and I certainly was around for a lot of dramatic things, such as that attack at the, in Pakistan at the time, which I recount in here. I put my character in the embassy when it's being attacked. So but, at this point? No, but there's more to that novel. It's not just danger and romance. There's, I'm trying to say something about cross-cultural romance and marriage and some of the difficulties. There wa <laughs> the background stories are my own, but there was no beautiful woman I, <laughs> that, that, uh, that my character uh, meets. I had to create that as a, I mean, uh, an amalgam of many uh, women who, that I met during the my foreign service time. But your, your question was? Well, the question is, your writing plans for the future, and what are your greatest accomplishments? What, what do you think about when you think about your life? Well, that was a lot of questions there. First, when it comes to the novel, uh, reviewers gave me the idea of a sequel. Okay. Because at least one or two of the reviewers, and they were very kind, and they said, but there's got to be more to this story. Uh, and so I have it all fleshed out in my mind, but I haven't written it yet. So there's a sequel just waiting. Uh, but I have to have time to do it, and I don't really, uh, there's no quarantine right now, and so I'm back to a more ordinary and vigorous structured life. life. A structured life, yes. Uh, you said... But also accomplishments. What, in your lifetime, what have been the accomplishments of which you're most proud? Well, first of all, I have to mention the fact that uh, I have four children, and uh, they're, they're upstanding citizens, and uh, they're leading productive lives, and I take a great deal of pride in that, so that's a great accomplishment in life. 
From a professional standpoint, well, uh, there's a story. Uh, one of the purposes of an American diplomat is to make friends for the United States so that then uh, it's easier to influence their activities in ways that the American government would like to influence them. Well, I found myself in Sierra Leone in West Africa being a charge d'affaires, that is acting ambassador for about a six month period. And uh, uh, that gave me a access and reason to get to know the president of the country and the foreign minister. And the, when the new ambassador came in, uh, presented her credentials and I was there at State House with her and she very officially and formally said, and hey, Mr. President, I would like to introduce you to my deputy. And he interrupted the president and he said, oh, you mean Steve, he's one of us. And then he gave me a high five. It took me by surprise and I have thought about that over the years. What did he mean exactly? So it's a little bit of a mystery, but I take great pride in the fact that he thought I was one of, of him. him, of his culture. Uh, I think I, for a brief moment, I fulfilled one of the goals of a foreign service officer. And not only that, but you've written three books as well, and uh, I'm sure you're very proud. Well, thank you, yes. Uh, the, the first day this came in the mail, <coughs> it was a great pleasure uh, to open the box. And I hope at some point uh, others have encouraged me, as I said, to expand on the writing. I really find it easy to write fiction because I wrote memos and reports and all these official documents for all of my career. But there were constraints. Now I have no constraints. <laughs> Good way to end. Oh. So I want to thank Stephen Eisenbrown for joining me today. And I hope this Stories of Life episode inspires you to think in new ways about your own life experiences. This program is broadcast Sundays at 5.30 p.m. and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. on Comcast Channel 69 or Verizon Channel 38 in Arlington, Virginia, or streaming live at those times on arlingtonmedia.org. Aging Matters is also on the radio. The program is broadcast every Tuesday at 2 p.m and Friday at 4 p.m. on WERALP Arlington 96.7 FM. Be sure and check out the Aging Matters website, agingmattersonline.com, for more information about all of our radio programs and TV episodes. Thank you for watching the program today, and please join me again for the next Aging Matters show. And until then, remember, age is just a number, not a label.